Show. Now, what if I told you that paedophilia is good for children, or that asbestos is an excellent inhalant for those with asthma, or that smoking crack is a normal part, and healthy one, of teenage life, to be encouraged? You'd rightly find it outrageous. But there have been similar statements coming out of inexpert mouths again and again in recent times, distorting the science. This is what The Economist magazine said last week about the election in America. Republican pessimism is more than a PR headache. Put simply, it is hard for a party to win national elections in a country that it seems to dislike. Mr. Romney's campaign slogan was, Believe in America. But too many on his side believe in a version of America from which displeasing facts or arguments are ruthlessly excluded. Todd Aitken did not implode as a Senate candidate because of his stern opposition to abortion, even in cases of rape or incest. Many Republicans in Congress share those views. His downfall came because in trying to deny that his principles involved a trade-off with compassion for rape victims, he came up with the unscientific myth that the bodies of women subjected to rape can shut down a pregnancy. It was a telling moment of denial. Much like the comforting myth that there is no such thing as climate change, or, if there is, that humans are not involved. Ensconced in a parallel world of conservative news sources and conservative arguments, all manner of comforting alternative visions of reality surfaced during the 2012 election. Many, like Mr. Aiken's outburst, involved avoiding having to think about unwelcome things, often basic science or economics. That from The Economist magazine last week. These distortions of science are far from trivial. Our neglect of what may be clear and urgent problems could be catastrophic. And now a professor of psychology at the University of Western Australia has shown what he says is the basis of this unrelenting debauchery of the facts. Well, I became interested in skepticism generally a couple of years ago in the context of the Iraq war. And I discovered that people who were skeptical of the reasons underlying the war processed information more accurately. And so I thought, hmm, that's interesting. A couple of years ago in 2009, when there was this eruption of so-called skepticism with regard to climate change, I thought, well, let's look at this and see if these people are really skeptics. And I then did have a look at the scientific literature and at what these so-called skeptics were saying, and I discovered that in actual fact, those people weren't skeptical at all. They were rejecting the science on the basis not of evidence, but some other factor. So I became interested in finding out what that other factor might be. And together with a couple other people around the world, uh, I started doing research on that. And what we basically found is that the driving, motivating factor behind the rejection of climate science is people's ideology or personal worldview, their fundamental attitudes towards how a society should be structured. That is what determines whether or not they accept the scientific evidence. And specifically, what we find is that people who are endorsing an extreme version of free market fundamentalism are likely to reject climate science. That's Stefan Lewandowski, professor of psychology at the University of Western Australia. His findings and those of Ian Walker of CSIRO show that the rejection of science goes beyond climate. They're also rejecting the link between smoking and lung cancer. They're rejecting the link between HIV and AIDS. So there seems to be something about an extremist free market ideology that prevents people from accepting scientific evidence. However, there's also a left-wing component, because I know of a number of Marxists or ex-Marxists who would infer that the Greenies, who are keen on climate science, are trying to deprive the poor of the world, the third world, etc., of the benefits that we have had in developing civilization to our own Western choices. Have you come across that kind of left-wing component of this as well? That's an interesting question. I've been doing some research for the past year or so, chasing people on the left side of politics who are rejecting scientific findings. 
And it turns out that that search has been extremely difficult. I've done a number of studies, including one most recently that involved a representative sample of Americans, a very large sample, and I looked at attitudes towards GM foods and towards vaccinations. And it turns out that statistically you cannot detect much of an effect from the political left. It must have been a couple of people like Alexander Coburn, who's just died, and the producer of the great global warming swindle, who at one stage was a Marxist, I don't know whether still has that, but that, that was the case made in that film, that these middle class lefties are simply trying to deprive the poor people of the world of the benefits. I think that's true. I think there are some spokespeople out there for anti-scientific positions who claim to have a left-wing Marxist background. But when you look at the population at large, you look at a large sample of people, then you don't find them. And that's on denial, I think. But, uh, well, let me ask you that question. If you're using such easy debating techniques, you're just insulting what? So even though you're the kind of person who is used to talking to cabinet ministers and the highest grade clever Sorry about experts that. in the field, but you would have a discount factor in this regard. When the camera amazing. battery dropped down. It's absolutely amazing. Knowledge. In fact, I mean, they're not just insulting uh, 97 out of 100 climate scientists. I think they're also insulting basically the enlightenment and everything that we've worked on for the last couple hundred years, which is to go from a dogmatic and religious approach to life to an evidence-based approach. So I think that the dismissal of science by people who are interacting with cabinet ministers, as you just said, I think that that is actually a very critical issue that is facing our society, and we have to understand what motivates those people. And one of the intriguing results is that neither education nor intelligence is overcoming the influence of ideology. There are some data, some American data on this, which show that among Republicans, the greater their level of education, the more likely they are to reject climate science. So in other words, educating Republicans drives them more towards denial, whereas if you educate Democrats, and you look at the effect of education on Democrats, then you find that the more educated they are, the more they accept the scientific findings. So you get this increase in polarization with education between Democrats and Republicans. And the same thing is, is true if you ask people about their rated self-professed knowledge of climate science, then people who are politically conservative, the more they think they understand the science, the more they will reject it. So, ideology is the overriding variable in this. Well, there's the problem. Now, whether the scientists are ultimately right, and scientists can be wrong, nonetheless, it's prevented climate science and the possible dire consequences of what we're facing to be discussed in the election in the United States. Now, that's a serious problem, is it not? Oh, absolutely. I think it is a serious problem, which is one of the reasons why I'm working on it, because, you know, we have to understand what motivates these people and how one can deal with that. And one of the things that one can do is to underscore the consensus among climate scientists about the fundamentals of climate science. You mentioned earlier that 97% of climate scientists agree on the fundamentals, and, and that number is roughly right. I mean, it's, you know, in the 90s, 90% or more. It turns out, one of my re recent studies showed this, that if you tell people about this consensus and the strength of the consensus and if you show them a graph that shows 97 people who agree on one thing and then there are three who don't that consensus information does shift people's attitudes and what i found in one of my studies is that that shift in attitudes is particularly pronounced among people who would otherwise reject climate science based on their personal ideology so that is one of the things that I think is a successful strategy, is just to keep underscoring the consensus, the fact that the scientists agree, the fact that every single major scientific organization in the world is endorsing the basics of climate science, and so on. I think that is a very important thing to underscore over and over. So what about the number of people who are, if you like, denying it? A paper published by one of your colleagues this week suggests the number is fewer 
than one would have thought. Absolutely. Mm. That's been shown over and over again. In Australia, in this survey you just mentioned by Ian Walker, the number of people who deny that climate change is happening is, is around 5 or 6 percent of the population. But those 5 percent, if you then ask them how many people they think is sharing their opinion, their response is, oh, about 50 percent. So what we have here is a fringe opinion that is, that is held by very, very few Australians. But they have convinced themselves that half the population agrees with them. And this phenomenon is called a false consensus effect, technically. And that phenomenon is usually indicative of a distortion in the media landscape. Other research has shown that in other instances, that if people develop this sort of self-inflation, where they're, they're inflating their self-importance, that usually is indicative of the media not doing their job properly. And there's no question in my mind that in Australia the media have done a terrible job in representing the science. And there have been a lot of analyses recently pointing out that in particular certain publications out of the Murdoch empire are systematically misrepresenting the science, distorting it, representing things that are simply not true. That happens over and over again and is difficult to explain by <laughs> any uh, sort of random process. We, there must be something else going on there. And I think one of the consequences is that this fringe opinion has taken hold in public discourse. Now, you're a psychologist and I think there's no great difficulty in trying to understand that if you are being told that the entire globe is threatened in a way that's pretty dire, you'd rather think otherwise. So isn't there a component of wishful thinking about this as well? Absolutely. Totally. I think that is absolutely true. And what is very interesting about this is that there are some data to suggest that a lot of the people who deny at first glance that human beings are responsible for climate change, they actually do know that we are responsible. And it's a very funny result. This is again in Ian Walker's research. What he's done is to, is to ask people, you know, well, if the globe is warming, are people responsible or not? And then it turns out that about, you know, 40 to 45 percent of the people will acknowledge the fact that the globe is warming, but they will say, no, people have nothing to do with it. It's all natural fluctuation. Now then, a minute later, if you ask them, who is responsible for global warming? Pick a few of the following from this list. Then even the people who just said it was all natural, pick polluting corporations, large industrialized countries, etc., etc., and assign the responsibility for warming to them. Now that tells us that these people actually know who is responsible. And so their quote-unquote denial is, is only skin deep. And I think what's happening there is that this is just a, a tool for people to exercise their wishful thinking, to say, no, it's all natural fluctuation, and then they can go on driving their big trucks or whatever it is they're doing. I, I, think, I think there is there is that. Now, I think there's a larger implication of this, and that is that one of the problems we've been having is that climate change has always been communicated in a doom and gloom fashion. And obviously that turns people off, and it's totally understandable why it would do that. So what we have to find is a different way of talking about climate change, and a way that is underscoring the... we got to put a positive spin. ...with it when it comes to the development of clean energy underscoring the fact that the problem is solvable with considerable effort and money but it is a solvable problem and i think we have to highlight those That's solutions and in the we have to try and highlight the fact that there are new entrepreneurial opportunities out there in dealing with the problem you're not part of a marxist leninist cell hidden away in western australia are you well that depends on who you ask <laughs> i don't think so but uh, since I publish in the peer-reviewed literature, a lot of people think, therefore, I must be a communist, yes. 
The distinguished professor of psychology at the University of Western Australia, Dr. Stefan Lewandowski, and those conclusions in a week when two organizations, one the World Bank, warned that we may be heading towards a four degree Celsius warming with all that entails. Well, we know about ignoring elephants in the lift, and Douglas Adams wrote about horses turning up in the bathroom, but how can you ignore a gorilla on the basketball court? Well, Samantha Maskell is a prize-winning psychologist from Oxford, and I saw her give a talk on this astounding... OK, YouTube, this is Warbles Oliver. That was the most erudite view I have recently heard concerning why the global warming denialists persist in denying that global warming is a reality, that it is a dangerous reality, and that it is, in fact, man-made. They don't want to know because they don't want to know, because once they know, then they'll have to take it seriously, and if they have to take it seriously, they have to change the way they do things. They would also have to reappraise their traditional ancestor worship. They would have to reconsider their household gods of endless growth, of more, 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 of whoever dies with the most toys wins. And they don't want to reappraise any of that. They don't want to consider that for somebody to live in the suburbs and have 50 kilowatt hours a day of coal-fired electricity consumed by their house, that's the equivalent of 75 horsepower for one hour. And they get through that in 24 hours. So it's like having a team of three horses constantly working. Just to run their house. And to have three working constantly, you'd better have four more teams. So the horses can have a rest. So how many people does it take to look after 12 horses? And where are you going to get the feed? And then consider how hard it is to turn a horsepower from an actual horse into an electric horse. You're going to need thousands of horses just to make the electricity to run one suburban house if the grid falls down. And the grid's vulnerable to extreme weather events, and extreme weather events are caused by carbon emissions and global warming. So Gaia's revenge is about to switch the grid off. And the people who are dependent on the grid don't want to know, just like the people who live close to the ocean don't want to know about one or two metres sea level rise in the next 90 years. It's inconvenient, so they block it out. They think it makes sense to put money aside in superannuation so when they retire in 30 or 40 years time they can have 50% of their working wages because the pension's not good enough for them. They don't understand that all of their superannuation funds are being used to maintain liquidity in the short-term money market and by the time they're old enough to retire it's going to be gone because the economy is contracting. Because you can't have any economic activity without an environmental surplus and 5,000 years of economic activity funded by deficit finance, usury, forbidden by God for 5,000 years, it's got nowhere to grow into. It's destroyed the planet's environmental surplus. It doesn't matter how many chainsaw factories you've got if there are no forests left. Who cares if you've got a super fishing trawler, if there are no fish in the ocean? The economy has run its race. And the people who have done it, the people who have profited the most from it, don't want to know. The people who have invested the most in the delusion that they can retire and live a life of luxury for the next 50 years, have guessed wrong. They've worked their asses off to buy a pig in a poke. And, well, it was their choice. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.